Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. The book we're going to be talking about tonight is The Ancestor by Danielle Trussoni. Here's a little bit about her. Uh, this is taken from the book jacket because the Amazon uh, bio is really out of date. So just going to the most up-to-date source, which is the book that just released, we're going to be talking about. So here we go. Danielle Trussoni is the best-selling author of the supernatural thrillers Angelology and Angelopolis. She's the co-creator with Hadrian Royo of the Crypto Z audio series podcast, A Companion to the Ancestor. She writes the horror column for the New York Times Book Review and has recently served as a jurist for the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. That's you know, no big deal. Trussoni holds an MFA in fiction from the prestigious Iowa Writers Workshop, where she won the Missioner Copernicus Society of America Award. Her books have been translated into 33 languages. She lives in the Hudson River Valley with her family and her pug fly. Man, we should probably just review that bio. Dude. The <laughs> jurist for the Pulitzer Prize in fiction. That's, that's uh, that seems like pretty hefty <laughs> stuff, right? I mean, I'm not misreading that. Like, Yeah, that seems like kind of a big deal. They really buried the lead. That would be like the first sentence if it was my bio. I feel like we know somebody else um, who was in that Iowa Writers Workshop, and I can't think of who it is. It's a, I mean, it's one of those, like, if you were in it, you write it in your bio because it's supposed to be a big deal kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah. Sure. Um, but uh, I guess instead of reviewing the bio, I'll just review this book. And uh, this book, The Ancestor, uh, it goes a little something like this. It feels like a fairy tale when Alberta... Bert Monti receives a letter addressed to Countess Alberta Montebianco at her Hudson Valley, New York home that claims that she's inherited a noble title, money, and a castle in Italy. While Bert is more than a little skeptical, the mystery of her aristocratic family's past and the chance to escape her stressful life for a luxury holiday in Italy is too good to pass up. At first, her inheritance seems like a dream come true, a champagne-drenched trip on a private jet to tour in Italy, lawyers with lists of artwork and jewels bequeathed to Bert, a helicopter ride to an ancestral castle nestled in the Italian apps below Mont Blanc, a portrait gallery of ancestors Bert never knew existed, and a cellar of expensive vintage wine for Bert to drink. But her ancestry has a dark side, and Bert soon learns that her family history is particularly complicated, as Bert begins to unravel the Monte Bianco secrets, she begins to realize her true inheritance lies not in a legacy of ancestral treasures, but in very genes. G-E-N-E-S, just in <laughs> case anyone was wondering. Yeah, not her dungarees. <laughs> I felt good to say the word dungarees, but... That all is, right, so. that's, that's, yeah, I mean, most people have just gone with Levi's, yeah. you know, but yeah, dungarees, yep. Dungarees, there you go. Um, yeah, so uh, pretty good synopsis, I'd say. Like, it really hits it's the high points. I think a little bit more dramatically than I would have expected, but um, it, it does the trick. Um, the book starts out... So first of all, I want to say the book is, I think, entirely uh, first person. It's from the perspective of Bert, if I, if I remember correctly. Um, so uh, it's, Mostly, yeah. It, there are some journal entries that oh. we read. Yeah. Yeah, there's an epistolary, um, I guess, element as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so first person, and it starts out with um, uh, Bert, the main character, kind of reflecting on, oh, you never know what it's going to be like to uh, find out that you're, you know, a, a royal heiress or something like that. And talks about coming home one day, finding a letter in the mail that basically, you know, seems very strange and, and out of character for the types of mail that she would receive, but it's all in Italian and she doesn't know what it says. So she decides to go visit her um, estranged husband, Luca, because um, uh, her family are all past, but he's got um, parents who are Italian. So he wants to try and get this letter translated to find out what it's all about. Yeah, a little bit about their relationship. Um, they've had uh, a, a few miscarriages, essentially. Um, and that has caused, uh, as often happens in couples, for there to be some, some strain on the relationship. And they're estranged, but like very friendly. And it feels very much like reconciliation is on the horizon. Like Luca's very supportive of her and she loves him dearly. It's just that, you know, she needed some time. So it seems like they're on the mend. 
Um, so when she approaches him, you know, she tells him what's going on. He goes, she goes to see his mother. So Nona is uh, is more in the know. And it comes down to this. Both families are from the same village originally. Basically, Bert's grandfather left Italy, came to the U.S., did the name change, did all that stuff. But there were still stories that hovered around his family that that Luca's grandparents knew and, and therefore Nona knew. And eventually we find out that Luca knew about this stuff, too. And they're really about they're kind of like a terrible, tyrannical family who lives in a secluded castle. And there was all types of like, you know, monster vibes around that castle. Pretty much any time you have a castle, right, there's going to be monster. So specifically, there are ones around the Monte Bianco family. Yeah, so as Livia's kind of mentioned, um, after everybody emigrated to the United States, um, Lucas family, Bert's family, the, it, it, there was just some like general tension and um, distancing from from Bert's family with the rest of the Italians that moved over here, but never really talked about why. Um, when the letter comes up, um, and she asks Nona to translate it, that's when you discover that, you know. Um, something's going on here and it has to do with the fact that she's descended from this Monte Bianco family. Nona tells her what's going on, but she says, Hey, you don't really want to have anything to do with this. Like there's, there's bad stuff here. It would be best if you just leave this alone, throw this away, pretend like you never received it. Now, the problem is like, if I were to get a letter saying, Hey, you, you're, you're a, of, of a noble bloodline. That's, that's kind of tough to, to look away from. So, um, yeah, yeah that, that's where I, I, I think I would, I would, I would, I can't imagine not being compelled to look into that. Right. Yeah. I mean, if you get a letter saying that you're the, you're now a Baron Olson, Olson right. Or something like that's Yeah. I, I, yeah. I've always felt kind of Baron like, yeah. <laughs> Regal. So, and yeah, some, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> yeah. And f- forget that. Like, it's a shit ton of money, right? Like, that's kind of how yeah. it's presented is that it's also a lot of money. So even if you don't want to be the Countess Monte Bianco, right? Like there's there's cash money um, tied to this. And, you know, who couldn't use a little bit of that? Totally. So essentially, uh, after she finds all this out, she's approached by a, a lawyer, uh, Enzo, an Italian lawyer who has been sent by the family, um, you know, to collect her. Uh, to bring her to the lawyers there so they can go through the process to um, to get her her countess ship in place. Anyone knows countess ship award? Her contestry? I don't know. Something <laughs> along those lines. Yeah. Contestination? Contestination. I like that one too. Um, so uh, clearly the, the lawyer comes with money. Um, there's a private jet. There are passports already made for her and Luca um, as a uh, she is considered an Italian uh, citizen because she, because of her her position in this family, and uh, yeah, private jet. I believe that's mentioned a, uh, a champagne soaked private jet trip to Italy. Yeah, I gotta tell you, like of all the baller shit that you know comes along in the beginning of this book, one of the things that I've always thought would be the coolest thing ever would be to be to have dual dual citizenship. Like I don't know why, but for me dual citizenship would just be the coolest shit so like if so like that would be the if i had any reservations the moment they handed me a passport for another country i'd be like all right i'm in whatever i don't care if like you know it, this is like some sort of you know human trafficking thing <laughs> all right i would but you what? get what i'm Jesus. saying like that it would be the thing that would trick me into falling into a human tra- trafficking scheme for Oddly, sure. um, you're the only person I know who volunteers for human trafficking. <laughs> so, um, I will tell you, my uh, my father has dual citizenship. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. It might be a little less cool than you think. <laughs> Just, <laughs> I, I mean, I'll tell you. So as, as an aside, I will I will tell you a, a, a brief story. Um, my parents came here from Romania. Obviously, anybody who listens to the show knows that. Um, they both had dual citizenship. Um, no reason to get rid of no reason to get rid of their Romanian citizenship until and I don't remember this would have been oof, 80 something, 87, 88, maybe um, my mom applied to to for a visa to go to Romania. And the Romanian said, well, you have dual citizenship. We're not going to grant you a visa um, unless you renounce your American citizenship. So say what you will about the United States, but the most valuable citizenship in the world is is this one, right? 
So after my mom had consulted with, I don't know, an attorney or whoever at the time I was a teenager, um, they're like, no, 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 just renounce your Romanian citizenship. And then they really, I mean, unless you do something, they can't keep you out because Romania is not going to tell the United States that it's not accepting U.S. citizens without a really good reason. So she went from a dual citizenship to a single citizenship because her Romanian citizenship was going to prohibit her from being able to go to Romania. All right. The real puzzling thing for me about that is if you're a citizen of that country, why would you need to apply for a visa? Well, you're not a resident. So if you're not uh, a resident, uh, yeah. All right. Well, yeah. at least that makes sense. <laughs> so um, anyway. I'm, well, I'm uh, going to go ahead and attribute the dual citizenship to uh, being the reason that we are so high in the rankings for Romanian podcasts. Um, that... Yeah, we, we absolutely are. It's taken <laughs> nine years. <laughs> But we have made it to number two in, uh, and this is on on the big one on Apple Podcasts, in Romania Arts Books number two. Oh man, it's I mean this is better than any prize, any award yeah. we could get. I think. Yeah, we've won some awards, but nothing quite as prestigious <laughs> as number two in Romanian Arts Books podcasts. Totally. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry to take away from the story, but I, I heard dual citizenship and I was like, oh, I can actually toss something in That's, here. That was awesome. Thank you for that. Um, all right. So, uh, you know, champagne on the, on the plane, they get to Turin. That's kind of their layover spot before they travel to um, the the Alps, the area where into the Alps, the area where the, the town, I can't remember the name of it is, um, where the Monte Bianco castle is. And it's kind of like a weird... Um, like a date night for Bert and Luca a little bit. Um, they're really out of place. They have their American clothes on. So Enzo runs out and does some shopping and gets them some very nice expensive clothes because they're staying in a part of Turin that's like super fancy and rich and they would be out of place if they didn't have the right clothes. They have this wonderful dinner. She goes to a bookstore. They have a little fight. She goes to a bookstore, finds this, you know, she's trying to look at reading up on the region where the castle is and, and, all of the books that seem to be suggested have some sort of weird spin to them. Like they're, um, you know, urban legendy type of aspects to the books that she's finding. And in the course of, of doing some research, uh, comes across a story about a beast of the area that, um, they're going to, and it freaks her out. And, uh, she kind of goes wandering around Turin, bumps into Enzo and he's like uh all right let's go do this <laughs> more or less <laughs> essentially yeah and and along the way she has an argument with Luca and she's been told Luca's checked out of the hotel it's very um suspect I would say um it's a little that, sus that's what the kids yeah. are saying now it's sus yeah. really is that what kids are saying god I hate yeah, kids they're saying sus all right um so it's a little sus for you kids see if we can get to number two in kids arts books podcasts um but at any rate she they had had a fight whatever so she moves on so here's kind of the general layout um in the winter time there is no way to get to the castle or even to this village by uh by vehicle because it's a uh, it's on a mountain their roads are poor there's a ton of snow blah 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 so you helicopter in so she is helicoptered in with a promise that a helicopter will return for her in one week to pick her up. So she's essentially stranded with no way out of this castle. I mean, this sounds like the setting for a horror book, right? Totally. Um, yeah. It, I mean, I could think of a specific one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, a little bit. So, um, so yeah. So, basically, that that's what happens. That's where she, she starts to meet the um, remaining members of the... The Monte Bianco family, but you had a point you wanted to make, and I think this would be a good time to do that. So, um, it wasn't while I was reading the book, but almost kind of after the fact that I was reflecting on it, that I noticed a similarity of kind of the the structure of the beginning of the book being very similar to the structure of the beginning of the classic book Dracula, where um, in both books they kind of you know a person has to go to this very remote um, place. Uh, it's they're they're only supposed to be there for a short amount of time. Something happens that changes that short amount of time, and that's where we're pretty much at right now. So um, there's a lot that happens in the very beginning of 
Bert being at the castle that we'll explore. But essentially, it turns out, as is anybody who's listening probably predicted or you know already guessed, yeah, she stays there more than a week, significantly more. So, um, and the interesting thing is, the book kind of unfolds now as what's keeping her here, what is going on with this family. Um, is there any truth to these legends that she saw in the books about a, you know, a beast being uh, in the area? And and that's where the book really takes off is once she's stuck at this castle, um, she's got a bunch of stuff to figure out about her family and the region. Yeah, I want to touch on, uh, on a couple more characters and I want to correct myself. Um, it is uh, her father who immigrated from Italy from that region and not her grandfather, which is what I initially right. I want to kind of correct that. Um, so at the castle, um, essentially the, the, the main players that she's introduced to at that time um, is Dolores. Now, Dolores is the aunt, and you might be asking yourself, well, why is she inheriting um, if there is an aunt? Uh, the aunt is via marriage. Um, so Dolores does not inherit anything. It passes down through the Monte Bianco bloodline, which would be her. Um, there are uh, a number of servants in the castle. Um, and, and maybe something a little odd happening, like at the other end of the castle is probably the easiest way I could say it. And uh, through a variety of things, including, as I mentioned earlier, some journal entries and stuff, Bert is able to um, put together a, a better picture of the Monte Bianco family. Yeah, this is where we're going to start to tiptoe because um, there are big things that could easily be spoiled. Um, so we're pretty much coming up to the wall of spoilers and we're probably not going to go much further, but I will say that um, it is an interesting experience to read through someone um, discovering and exploring not only like a massive castle, but also um, the history of her family. So a lot of what she does um, while she's in the castle is to read up on her ancestry, which until you know that point, she really didn't know anything about at all, because even back home, her parents didn't talk about um the family where they came from uh, at great length at all. So she spends a lot of time discovering her heritage, which um, to noble families is, is a very big deal. So um, they have a portrait gallery that's got all of the different family members like painted in, in actual portraits, um, tons of literature on their, um, uh, their, their family tree and stuff, but also family members, um, personal diaries and stuff that she gets to read as well. So um, a, we get a, a great picture painted about what the generations leading up to this were. And that was a big part of um, that book once she got to the castle. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a good way to unfold um, a story. I think, I think that um I think Daniel did a did a really good job using kind of that blend of people um, communicating the history and these kind of you know we'll say discoveries that are made through through diary passages and stuff. We'll mention one more one more character, which is Vita, it's Bert's grandmother, who is um, the the reason that her father left um, Italy and came to the United States, but also. Uh, uh, kind of the like iron iron fisted matriarch of the family in her time, I guess, is is how she's presented to us. But there's some conflicting information comes to light um, through her discoveries at at the castle. Yeah. So uh, from there, um, it's really just her. Once she she gets a stronger picture of her family lineage, the good and the bad, um, then it's just her figuring out like how she fits into it and what's going to happen next. Um, I will say that like the thing that's hinted at about um, the, the ancestry having a dark side and the, the sort of like the, the lore of there being like a beast in the area is, is all covered as well. So that's, that's where the, the book takes us, but yeah, we got to hit the brakes on talking about what happens because anything else is a spoiler. Suffice it to say that there is a lot of, 
uh, really crazy and interesting shit that comes to, <laughs> to, comes to light. Yeah, one thing that that I want to say, and and I don't know if we can or or, or want to talk about this, but I had an idea of where I thought this book was going. You know. I, Pretty early on, right? So we've read a lot of books. Sometimes it's kind of easy. I don't want to say like predictable or anything like that, but you usually have a pretty good feel for where something's headed. Um, I, I did not expect the last third of this book at all, at all. So kudos. Yeah. Kudos to Mr. Sony for, for you know, keeping me in the dark um, for, for, as long, uh, for as long as she did. Yeah, I'm going to agree with that. That's one of the things that um, was interesting about the way that the story unfolded. And I'm remembering back to, so the book was re- recommended to us by um, Al Makatsu, who who talked about how um, in writing this book, Daniel Tresoni made some um, uh, bold kind of decisions with the story. And I'm going to say, like, yeah, it takes turns that I did not expect. And, and it's very interesting to see where, the story ended up. So yeah, I agree with you about that. Yeah. I don't know because it's just, I don't think it's easy to do when you're working with people who have read, I don't know if thousands is the right, but, but a lot, right. There's a lot of books read between the two of us. So yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of refreshing to catch something that was completely, completely out there. One thing that I, if it's okay, I'd like to explore is, and this is going to be like a, I want to get your take, take on this because, um, it's mentioned early on in the book that uh, the the Montebianco family uh, found Bert because Bert took a DNA test. And so she had taken a DNA test, sent it off, and had never gotten the results, which I thought was kind of you know a weird thing to add in the book. But if, essentially, um, in their search for an heir, when an heir was uh, necessary to find, um, they basically just plugged in some family DNA, found a match, and that's how they got to her. I've always been very, not against, but personally hesitant to do DNA tests because that's when all the weird shit happens where you find out your father's not your father and like all oh, the whole families fall apart and stuff like that. Um, so I guess maybe that's why I haven't found out that I'm, you know, a Duke or whatever we said before. <laughs> yes. Uh, yep. So, because I'm not going to do that shit. What, I don't know how you feel though. Like, would you... I, um, yeah, you know, I thought about it and and I'll be honest, every, every like black Friday for the last, I don't know, like four or five years, (laughs) I've considered it right. Cause they go on sale and you're like, Oh, it's only like, it's, it's only 99 bucks now. And I'm like, Oh, that's kind of cool. Um, here's my understanding. Cause I, I know a few people, um, who have, who have done these. So what you actually get back and again, I, this is all, um, just, you know, secondhand information. Um, what you get back is like, like I would probably come back and it'd be like, Oh, you're 70% Romanian and you know, like 10% Serbian and whatever, 5% Italian and you know, whatever a bunch of generations ago, there was a little bit of whatever, I don't know, Iraqi or something. You know what I mean? So you just get a breakdown, but apparently you can select if you would like other people who have, who are likely family members to be able to access your information. Yeah. So it's not necessarily that you'll find, you know, that you do this, that you're Duke Olson, right, of whatever, Sweden or whatever. Um, you can get it just to get what your breakdown um, geographically is in, in your history. Yeah. Um, which I think is kind of cool. Or you can do the other thing. Now, do you remember, and I can't, what was the serial killer that they caught because of a... Oh, one of the, the uh, uh, it was the one that um, Pat Oswald's late wife did, right? Um, yep, yep. Yeah, uh, I can't remember. It is California? I, I know you're talking so about. There is, yep. So there is, uh, there is that too. That you know. So if you get anything really <laughs> dark in your past, your personal past, maybe it's not the best idea. Um, but yeah, I, I think about it every year, and at some point, I I will probably pull the trigger and do it. I, I, one of my concerns is that like that the um, it, it's a privacy thing. Like um, I'm, and I'm not that guy who's like the government's out to get me, but those companies sell that information to third parties and they're allowed to like, if like, I don't know mm-hmm. if all of them do, but they can. And I just don't know, like if I want my complete genetic breakdown, like up for sale. So that's, that's the thing that's holding me back. Well, there you go. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, like I said, I, I, you know, I don't know. I, I know somebody who found some pretty surprising information in, in, in their, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. where they're like, oh, re- Jesus, really? Well, I'll tell so you what. It, uh, actually, like, the I have... I have the the old school analog version of that, and that is that my aunt loves to do um, genealogy, mm-hmm. and so she's the one that drives around to like grave gravestones and stuff, and finds information yeah. and like collates it. She actually had a mm-hmm. microfiche machine in her house to look at old records and stuff like that. That's how like hardcore she microfiche, dude. Dude, that's pretty. That's so pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, but the thing that doesn't tell you is, you know, when, you know, you're whatever great grand aunt was like stepping out on your great oh, grand yeah, uncle that's true you know what i mean and you suddenly find out that you know you're <laughs> like well, what do you what do you mean i'm uh what country's borat from you know you find out you're yeah, actually kazakhstan or yeah kazakhstani or some kind, kind of craziness <laughs> that you know no one's ever mentioned in your family and that's because you know nobody knew that's true that's a good point so yeah so uh yeah but i thought that that was uh that was kind of interesting, and, and not just that, but going through her ancestry, I, I thought was um, was was pretty in- interesting because we're introduced to a pretty solid number of characters who we're not going to talk about, but it, it was it was a it was a nice touch, and it it all flowed together very well in the story. All right, another thing that I want to bring up comes from actually the the synopsis, and that is the fact that there is a companion podcast launching. Um, in in support of this and it's called crypto z um olivia i don't know if you had time to check it out but i did go and look at the podcast uh right now the only thing that exists is like a two minute trailer where it is um part of the actual drama where a scientist you know is distressed and talking about oh there's i discovered something that's going to change change everything um and then um, Hadrian Royo comes on and says, Hey, thanks for listening. This podcast is coming out soon. And, um, yeah, that kind of thing. So, uh, right now it's just a trailer, but apparently there's going to be a whole fiction series based around, um, some of the stuff uh, that happens in the book, like, uh, based on the things that are mentioned in the book, I guess. That's a that's a pretty cool that's a pretty cool concept. I don't know if we're um, aware of anything like that, that that's come before. Yeah. yeah, companion. I don't know. Like uh, the big thing, <laughs> the one thing I'll warn anybody who doesn't, if you if you if you're thinking about doing both, definitely read the book first because even just the image or the name of the podcast um, kind of spoils some stuff. <laughs> so. Um, if it sounds interesting to you, read the book and then go um, find the podcast. I agree. Um, I think that's it, right? We're ready to kick off uh, wrap ups. Yeah, um, I will. I'll take the helm on this one. Okay. This, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this book was uh, put on our radar by Alma Katsu, who uh, we read The Deep and The Hunger and did an interview, a wonderful interview with her. She's uh, very interesting person and she this she spoke very highly of this book and so we thought hey what the heck let's check it out um so it came it came with a recommendation but it also came with her saying something along the lines of how um like we mentioned before daniel trussoni made some very brave kind of uh choices with the way the story went went down so i didn't know what to expect um going into this book i think that there are a lot of strengths to the way it was written um, a lot of the technical side of things, like um, like how she crafted um, the book around, like the pace of the book, the narrative, um, the way that the people spoke and everything was was all very good and very consistent. I had a couple of like some of the turns that the plot took kind of threw me off in a way that I wasn't expecting, and so um, I feel like I didn't have the opportunity to stay completely rooted in the story because there were some big not leaps but changes that just kind of threw me off my my balance a little bit as as i was reading it through so um overall it was a i will say it was an interesting story all the way through um it was always one that kept me kind of wanting to know what was happening uh kept me guessing and again like she's very proficient in the way that she writes and so it was easy to get through um but just a little bit kind of weird for me in a way that it, it's tough for me to explain. Um, I feel like the biggest 
setback for me was the fact that I couldn't feel like I was on solid footing as I was following the plot as it twisted around. Um, so while overall, I think that this was a good book and I would definitely say people should check it out if you're into um, that type of lineage focused, ancestry focused um type of it's it's almost got a gothic feel to it at least at parts of the book um it's definitely worth checking out for me it was just a little too windy of a path to like really get a good to maintain a good momentum on if that makes sense so overall this one comes out for me at 6.63 out of 10 um i agree with everything rob said about interesting and and unsuspecting Maybe is a is a is a way that I would put it. I was very unsuspecting of where this book was uh, was going to be going, and and I like that um, of it. My um, issue. So let me before I move into my issues, I guess um, I thought that stuff was really good, and I liked the ancestry stuff, and I liked you know whatever reveals and and all of that. The way the the we wound through that plot, although surprising, I thought was was done very well. Um, my my biggest issue with this was. I felt absolutely no attachment to the main character and that's where it fell short for me. And, and I will, um, I will give one example because I don't think it's spoilery and because we, we kind of covered the scene in the course of the review. So Bert goes into a bookstore. She asks for, uh, any books on this village area and she finds some, and it's just like brief mentions and nothing real interesting. And then the, the, the um, bookstore owner um, says, Oh, you know what? I think there's something in one of the books in the occult section. So she gets this book and she opens up and there's like a whole chapter in there. And there's a story about the, the beast of Monte Bianco. Right. And there is a um, photo and she freaks out so bad that she literally runs out of the bookstore and the, the melodrama exhibited there um, put me off a little bit. And I said, all right, okay. But then I, I don't know. I just felt, I felt like that character's decisions throughout the course of the book were very different than what mine would have been without saying too much. Um, and, and it made it really hard for me to, um, to kind of embrace the character. So although I thought the story was, was really good and, and really well thought out, I had a little bit of a disconnect with the protagonist, which is tough to do, especially in a book that's first person and still have like a super high opinion. That being said, my score came out to a seven out of 10, which is still very good. Um, I think for me, um, maybe a, a, another a rewriting of Bert could have made this, you know, an eight and a half, maybe even a nine. But uh, seven is where I landed. That gives us the average um, rating between the two of us, 6.812. There you go. And as you were saying that, actually, um, something that occurred to me, which we're probably not going to have the luxury of doing, is I wonder how this book would go on a reread now that you know kind of like the whole scope of the book and everything would going through the story again kind of make you feel better about it. I think I think on a reread, I would I would have a better opinion of the book. Um, yeah, I, 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 okay, and not not to say that it's anything like it, but it's kind of like you'd go back and rewatch the Usual Suspects or the Sixth Sense, right? right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could I could totally see that because then you're like, For sure. you're aware of of the things that maybe didn't yeah. seem to make sense at the time. Yeah, yeah, the whole scope of the story, yeah. and then yeah, yeah, I could, could see that. So there you go. I think that was book ten for the year. I believe so. I think book ten. We're and killing it. We're, we're back to recording on uh, on a holiday. Oh, <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah, it's Easter. Um, it's Easter Sunday right now, um, April twelfth, that we're recording this. So, uh, Livius, I know your Easter, it, it just because you got to be different, is is not today. Um, yep. And I'm a big old atheist, so I don't believe in. Well, I was, yeah, so I was I was gonna say let's let's play. I was gonna tell you it's Palm <laughs> Sunday, then I was gonna ask you what Palm Sunday was, but you have no fucking idea. No. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's probably, does that, it, I'm guessing it has nothing to do with like tropical regions. Palm, um, palm, actually, like palm trees. Actually it does. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, happy oh. Easter to you oh, and you to the, the, the rest of the podcast world. If you celebrate it or not, it's still Easter. I mean, look, maybe you don't believe that, um, Christ was crucified and then resurrected three days later, but you probably believe in the Easter bunny, right? So it's Easter either way. Wait, do some people not? believe in the easter 
bunny. Yeah, apparently when you're like 12, like 11, 12, you stop believing in the Easter bunny. Oh, fuck. Well, I don't know how these <laughs> eggs keep showing up in my house every year. Then. <laughs> Dude, I hate to break it to you, but this is where you're going to want to, if you've got kids listening, turn this podcast off. Um, it's the, the only thing we did, we left the house today to go and um, hide Easter eggs outside the grandchildren's homes um, and not even see them, but just so they, they could be surprised and go outside and find out that the Easter bunny did indeed have an Easter egg hunt. Like we weren't going to have it because normally there's like a, you know, like a meal and, yeah. you know, all the kids are together and stuff. So we independently went to their two residences and um, hid eggs and stuff outside. That's very cute. It is very cute. Got to keep the kids happy. Yes. Um, what else have you been doing? Look, so I want to acknowledge that we did five episodes in nine <laughs> days. And really, when I say acknowledge that, I'm not even paying myself on the back. I want to pat Rob on the back. Because that's a lot of work for him. That is not a lot of work for me. Because he has to edit all that shit too. So we brought you uh, three <laughs> interviews and took two book reviews in the span of nine days. So Rob, excellent job, my man. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, people, some people are noticing. Like I got some um, text messages from Adam and Oshkosh whose uh, legs don't work. Um, and I think we got a message on Facebook or something saying mm -hmm. like, "Oh, well, you guys are crushing it with like your pace. Um, Big wall work. Oh, there you go. But Adam and Oshkosh did send me some texts today. He really appreciated this Grady Hendrix uh, interview that we recently did. Um, he says, holy shit, this Grady Hendrix interview is definitely the most unexpectedly hilarious interview in years. He's an absolute riot. Uh, so there you go. I agree. I've been meaning to listen to that one. I just I haven't had a chance to to re-listen to it because it's always so much different when I listen to them than when we're doing them. I've noticed that like the people that um, aren't, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this because like once we've talked to people, they're people we know, so that's a weird thing to say. But like Grady Hendrix was never really part of like our big reading scene, um, mm -hmm. so he's kind of like he's kind of new to us. And there was um when we did the Duchovny interview and he was talking about um, <laughs> technology and stuff like that. And he said something about like, if he could go back in time with a toaster and be the, the King of France or something like that. Mm -hmm. Holy shit, man. So like, there's these unexpected, it's these unknown elements when they come in and talk to us that like, they kind of blow you away with, with uh, what they got to say. I don't know if you have an answer to this, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask the question anyway. How many times do you think you've listened to that David Duchovny interview? Ooh, good question. So um, obviously there was a time that we actually had the conversation oh, sure. and I had to listen to it to edit it. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, um, maybe one more time. I'm surprised because I know you're you're a rewatcher and a re-listener of mm -hmm. things. So I'm, I'm surprised. I thought that wouldn't be a little higher on your... I know, I know. I, I don't know, like, yeah. You know, it's probably going to be one that I visit at intervals <laughs> but i haven't like worn a worn a hole in the tape yet so the next the next time the uh, x files gets uh, rebooted or whatever i'll listen to it again oh my god no we're gonna have him back on the podcast yes for sure for <laughs> sure um, um so i want to talk about what i watched yesterday so you know I, I, well you know but people probably know that that you uh, frequently harangue me about the the few number of movies that i watch oh so here we go Yesterday, I watched three movies all in the same day, back to back to back. Are they so one of them? <laughs> are they related? Um, no, no. Oddly, yeah, two of them are. So the first one I watched was uh, Angel Has Fallen. Are you familiar with that? Mm, why do I think Gerard Butler's in that? I'm pretty sure that's Gerard Butler. Okay. Um, I, I guess I didn't realize. Like I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure this is kind of a sequel to Olympus Has Fallen, which came out years ago. And uh, turns out it was, but there was a second movie in between too called London Has Fallen, yeah. which yeah. I did not see. So I watched that. That's essentially uh, Gerard Butler. I'm pretty sure that's him. Um, is a Secret Service agent who's you know kind of had a rough rough time of it. You know he's been in two major motion pictures, which means you know he's been through some calamities. <laughs> And he's like suffering a little physically and maybe even mentally. Um, and he's about to, to move on to a position where he's going to be head of the Secret Service, which is more of a desk job than, than being out in the field all the time. Because he's too old uh, for this shit? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, 
so as he's offered the job, he's on a fishing trip with the president working, you know, like he's part of the detail. And an attack happens on the president, who is Morgan Freeman. And he is um, framed for the assassination attempt. So he has to go on the run, and he is this time fighting um, the FBI, um, plus the people that framed him. So in the previous movies, or at least in Olympus Has Fallen, it was like him versus terrorists. You know what I mean? But this time, yeah. it's it's very Jack Bauer, right? Like the government's <laughs> after him, but so are these other people. So um, it, it was for an action movie, like it, it was okay. The, the tech was a little over the top, which I thought was fun. Um, they're not terribly realistic, but fun. But then I noticed that Last Blood, Rambo Last Blood, mm, was on Amazon go. Prime. So uh, in talking to my girlfriend, she had never seen any of the Rambo movies. And I thought, all right, well, I can't fucking slug through all of them. There's no no way, <laughs> right? Because there's five movies. And I've seen all of them, like when they were released. Well, maybe not when they were released, but you know what I mean? The last couple I saw years ago, like right around when they had timely. You know, yeah, video on demand and stuff. So I was like, all right, we'll watch First Blood. So at least you have the origin. And then we'll go to the most <laughs> recent and probably final movie in the franchise, Last Blood. So we watch those two back to back. Um, and I, I remember telling you that you should watch Last Blood. So mm -hmm. how yep. was that? How did that recommendation turn out? Um, I liked it. Um, I liked it quite a bit. I don't want to spoil anything. There's one particular element of it that, that made me very sad that I thought was the wrong direction. And I'm pretty sure you can figure out what I mean by that. Um, and we'll talk about it off the air. Oh, but I know or, exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. I, I was I was a little disappointed in, in the storytellers for, for one particular choice that they made. <laughs> um, other than that, I, I, I really liked it. If you want to see, it's so funny because watching them back to back, the parallels between how he handles the manhunt in first blood and how it's hand, you know, how the, the climax of this movie is handled are very similar. And it's a nice touch considering the fact those movies are, I think it's like 38 years apart or something. Um, That's awesome. So yeah, I, I yeah, I, I liked it quite a bit. Oh, makes, I think I've given you two good recommendations for movies now, which is like, yeah, pretty, I pretty mean, astonishing. yeah, ever. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. Ever, <laughs> um, that's it. Not watching anything else. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm so we started watching Belgravia. Never heard of it. Yeah, I know. I left. I left that pause in, in there specifically so yeah. that you get. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a period piece um, from the 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 creator of Downton Abbey. So we watched like four uh, episodes. Of that. Um, caught up, like all caught up to like this week or whatever on that. Um, period piece about uh, family family and uh, societal struggles in the 1800s in England um, that's about it some crap oh watch like a bunch of Jeopardy on Netflix oh yeah yeah it's yeah. good stuff right yeah 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 so uh, you know a lot a lot of the TV viewing has been kind of nothing worth discussing I guess you know what I mean nothing real special how about you um, well yeah the the influx of of podcasting has kind of cut back my availability to view stuff. But the last two days, um, I, I've obviously the book was done, so I didn't have to read anymore. Um, so I had a little extra time. I did watch. Um, I rewatched season one of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, and then I watched season two as well. So have you heard of that at all? You know, here's what's funny. I don't mm. think I knew that a season two was available. I did watch season one, and I remember enjoying it. But like, we watched it like a whirlwind, like one day, the whole thing. Oh, I'm actually kind of surprised you uh, watched that. Did you? And you? And you enjoyed it? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So the reason I watched it was because um, it, you know, it's based on the books by Douglas Adams, who is one of my favorite authors ever. Wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I knew there was a season two that I had just never gotten around to watching, um, mostly because it's put out through BBC America. Um, and so finding it streaming, I thought was going to be difficult, but it ends up that it, that both seasons are on Hulu. So, um, yeah, I decided to just on a lark, go through a rewatch of season one, remembered how great I thought it was, and then just dove right into season two, which is definitely way weirder. Um, but, but also very good. 
the only reason I knew that was a thing is because um, Doctor Who airs on BBC America, and mm-hmm. at the time, so did Orphan Black, and every commercial break was for <laughs> that. Every yeah. single commercial break, and like I said, we wound up watching it, enjoying it. I, I have vague recollection. I'd probably have to rewatch some of it, yeah, um, just to to kind of catch up to what happened. Was season two as good as season one? Um, yeah, it's definitely different. Um, it's it's obviously it's it's honestly more. Um, it's I'm trying to think. It, it's not as crazy and chaotic. It's more like character focused okay. and like um, people worrying about the uh, consequences of their actions and stuff like that but still very much in the vein, the same vein as the, the first season. For people who are listening um, if you've read the original books, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency and uh, The Long Dark Tea Time of the Soul um, it is established early in the first season for the people who have read the books it's very easily kind of pointed out that this takes place after those books um in a way that if you haven't read the hmm. books you wouldn't notice so i thought that was kind of clever but basically um as as dirk at one point is explaining you know stuff to someone he says there was a thing with a couch and then also something with thor and so in the first book um dirk gently solicit detective agency one of the things that comes up is a recurring thing in the book is that there's a couch stuck in a stairway in a way that is like physically impossible. And then in the second book, um, it has to do with like Norse gods, including Thor. So, um, yeah. So the seasons one and two take place after everything that happened in the original books. That's a, that's an interesting choice to, um, not, tell the story of the book. Right. You know, I was thinking about that too. And I, I'm not, um, we had Grady Hendrix on, he had mentioned the watchman. Yeah. And he was talking how about how like, yeah. that filled it. Yeah. But is that the, I was under the impression that was like a sequel to the watchman, like comic books is the impression I was under. And I didn't want to get, you know what I mean? That's that interview was great. I didn't want, we were kind of time limited. Do you know, is that, yeah, it is. Um, so yes, it is. It's it's a it is a very literal literal interpretation of much of the original story. Um, it leaves out a lot of stuff, but like you know, it's like um, like frame for frame at some points, like exactly what happens. Interesting. In the original okay. Watchmen. Obviously, the series is entirely different, but the movie. Oh, that's that's what I meant. That the series is actually a sequel and not. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. I, I felt like the way Grady was saying it was like, this is the stuff that didn't make it into the movie. And I was pretty much under the impression that this all took place after the. Right. The, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, interesting choices to do that. I mean, Watchmen at least. Ha- okay. It would be nice to think that everybody who watches TV will also pick up a book and read, but we know that's not the case. So that's why right. I'm surprised <laughs> that like Dirk Gently or, or I mean, like I said, the Watchmen has, you know, quote unquote source material on video, mm-hmm. uh, but it, it's an interesting choice to sequel a TV show and not retell it and continue on like true blood, right? Like true blood kind of started with true blood and then right. became its own thing. So did game of Thrones in some ways, but at least they yeah. all kind of start from the same, from the same source material. Yeah, and honestly, like I think that especially Douglas Adams fans are the type of fans that are easy, easily disappointed. Like, not like Star Wars fan level, you know, but like it's hard to tell um, to tell a story in a way that's going to be um, like that's going to honor the original story yeah. uh, without being just like a, a like a complete retelling in another medium. Um, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy movie. Um, was was a really good take on the original Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books, um, but definitely very different than the books. And the interesting thing is, um, I think it works so well because Douglas Adams himself helped write the screenplay. Um, so like that's why that movie feels good. With this series, I, it his books are so weird that you can get so mired down in the details of like what happened in the book. Like how do we include this fucking weird thing um that like it it wouldn't feel it's easy for it to not feel good i think is how it if that makes sense yeah well that's what i was gonna say i don't know i've never read them but i i I am under the impression that the books are batshit crazy and that that might be hard to (laughs) 
that might be hard to translate into another medium yeah for sure <laughs> um i think that's it man right yeah uh we got some interesting stuff coming up like uh livius has said in previous episodes like even though we're putting out more episodes that are not book reviews lots of book reviews in a, in, in in a row and that continues uh with what's coming up yeah the girl in the video by michael david wilson um will be next week it's a novella so it'll be a short review so think um part review part uh, interlude i'm guessing yeah um and we will have uh, michael on later this month to talk about that then we'll have the bank from bentley little who is the horror poet laureate according to stephen king yeah so uh ever since we um had a little chat with richard chismar um uh cemetery dance has been sending us some stuff and this is one of the ones that that hit both of our doorways so we're like yeah what the hell let's check it out and that's how uh that's how we got to that one i am trying to figure out so bentley little has probably like i don't know 20 something books out yeah and i'm trying to see i don't know if i've ever read any of his books there's a period of time um, I know it's come up on in the last couple episodes uh, a, a few times, the, the horror paperbacks of like the mm-hmm. 80s and 90s. There was a time where I was burning through some of those, and I was thinking, hey, I didn't keep detailed records or anything. I don't believe I've read anything from Bentley Little. I think this will be my first. Yeah. Uh, exciting stuff. And then uh, we also have a Christopher Moore book coming out or coming up soon, Shakespeare for Squirrels. Um, that Max Brooks devolution is uh, pretty close on the horizon as well. So um, basically until Livius decides to abandon the country, um, yeah, there's going to be a lot more content coming your way. Yep. So um, come back next week for The Girl in the Video by Michael David Wilson, and uh, we'll talk soon. Until then, I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livius Nedden. Keep reading.